I never thought, I guess I never really factored into my life as a chef um, working alongside women um, like this. Um, and I know that too good are life changing for them, but they are equally life changing for us. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The beautiful thing about food is the connections, not just the way we share food, the way it sustains us, the way it makes us feel when we eat something we love with those we love, but the way it crosses generations too, how recipes run a thread through families, how kitchens form a hub of transference to connect old and young with a common bond, being food. Some have built careers off that connection and taken it to new levels to connect those that are most in need of stability and connection to. Jen Shaw is the head chef at Two Good Co. Jen, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. You've done many things in your career and at the moment uh, you're the head chef at Two Good Co. How did that gig come about and what sort of impact has it had on you? Oh, it's had, well, I guess I start with um, how it came about. Um, I was a chef for many years and then um, had a little hiatus and worked for Young Henry's in Newtown for quite a few years as, as their um, event manager. Uh, and during that period of time, um, I met a lovely lady called Vanessa who um, sort of did what I did um, for Young Henry's but for Too Good uh, and had been there from the beginning like I had with um, with mm. Young Henry's. And um, we collaborated uh, on a couple of events and a brew uh, together. Wow. And I used to volunteer at some Too Good events and I thought, gosh, if ever I left Young Henry's or, you know, my, I fancied my life taking a bit of a turn, I'd love the opportunity to work with, um, with Too Good and eventually that opportunity arose and here I am. <laughs> tell, us, tell us a little bit about Too Good. We've had Rob on uh, Deep in the Weeds before, um, but what, what's your role with the company? Um, I started in uh, February last year, so beginning of last year, um, and I came on board initially as a mentor chef. So I just, I, I just really wanted to do something that sort of gave back to the community a little bit, um, or a lot in this case. Um, and so I was a chef working alongside some women who come into what we call the work work program, um, where they are women who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, most who, who have suffered some form of um, trauma. And um, we bring them into the kitchen and using the kitchen as the sort of the means, we give them um, soft work skills and kitchen skills to get them back into the workforce. Um, so I guess I, I came on board initially just as a mentor chef, just to be one of the people producing the food in the kitchen and training the women and, and mentoring them through their journey. Um, but then through a few twists and turns within a few months, I, I ended up head chef, which wasn't really um, something that I had planned, but it's certainly been an amazing journey. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I, I guess I always knew that I had it in me to be a head chef. I just didn't know that I had it in me to necessarily be, you know, not only a head chef, but also someone guiding these women and, and, um, and training them to this degree and um, developing these kind of relationships, which has been absolutely life-changing. So, After a career with many roles and many in, in kitchens and commercial kitchens, what, how different is that compared to the environment that you find yourself in training um, women that uh, need support and to uh, get back into society and need that support that you're offering? It's obviously completely different. Um, you have to wear many, many hats. You have to be um, a social worker. I mean, not that we're sort of obviously allowed to call ourselves social workers, but we definitely, I think, wear that hat um, as well as, you know, training them in kitchen skills. Um, and at the end of the day, we're also, we are 
a catering business. So we're still trying to pump out sometimes what seems like an insane amount of um, very lovely high-end catering, um, but using the sort of fairly limited resources in the kitchen as far as like the skills that the women actually have. So it's um, ultimately unbelievably challenging, um, but the reward is massive. So so when you're um, catering uh, large amounts, tell us about where this food goes and what, you know, what it's contributing in regards to Too Good. Yeah, so I guess the I guess the um, the means to success for Too Good lies within the people that obviously support the business, um, and those supporters are predominantly your sort of big um, your big businesses, um, big corporate businesses that purchase our um, sort of high end catering. Um, so you know we we send out beautiful corporate lunches um, like well, used to be lots of gorgeous shared salad trays and things. We've had to do a bit of a pivot to a lot of individual meals. Um, and then we also have what we call good things, which is beautiful body products, um, soaps and candles and things like that, um, which our women help to also um, create and package to send out as well. So that sort of the catering and the good things really floats the business, um, which obviously at the moment, and at this time last year was um, was challenging. Um, and when that happens, when we've had COVID um, and we're not getting the volumes of catering through, um, we've had to rely on a lot of very generous benefactors as well to help us get us through those periods. Um, but we really, really strive to be self-sufficient. And the only way that we can do that is to really sort of um, increase our catering and, and expand the business, which is what we're in the process of doing at the moment. Take us back to when you were young. What was food like for you when when you were a kid and when did you first get interested in food? Oh, for as long as I can remember. Um, my earliest memories are definitely food related. Um we used to spend every weekend or a lot of weekends with my grandparents. I grew up in Avalon on the northern beaches and my grandparents lived in Newport. Um, we used to go around there every Sunday for a family dinner. My grandma was the most incredible cook. Um, so we'd have a big family dinner every Sunday and we would also spend weekends with them quite regularly. When I was growing up and mum and dad had a had a weekend off um, and I was always, I spent the whole weekend with my grandma basically writing recipes and um, menus and setting out the table and baking lemon tarts and cooking everything. Um, I, I definitely grew up completely surrounded by food and, and that came from my mum as well. Um, very different. My grandma was very English and sort of cooked a lot of traditional foods, but she was amazing at it. Um, whereas my mum... I guess was a 1970s hippie um, who arrived in Australia from the UK with nothing but 20 bucks. Um, and her and my dad sort of built themselves up from absolutely nothing. Um, but she, you know, everything was very healthy. They made a little go a long way. Um, I grew up with her doing lots of bottling and preserving and um she used to make she used to make ginger beer. I remember the bottles exploding and the and the ginger beer hitting the ceiling and our, our ceiling in the kitchen was always stained with ginger beer. Um, and she'd have a roast chicken and we didn't have much money. We'd have a roast chicken and then the next night we'd have chicken pilaf and then the night after that we'd have chicken soup. She was very um very creative with very little and I think I've definitely um I've definitely got that from her. Tell us about when you first moved into hospitality and, and what it was like stepping into a commercial kitchen. Do you remember those days? I remember being told very strongly by my mum and dad that it was probably a terrible idea to be a chef, <laughs> even though it's all I ever wanted to be. <laughs> I um I spent, yeah, many hours thinking about, you know, being a chef, but actually not, obviously having no idea of the realities of that. Um and I put it off for ages. I, I went travelling all through Europe um, in when I finished, as soon as I finished school and then through India, um, lived and worked in Greece for a while. And I came back still with that desire to be a chef, but again, tried to sort of push it aside. And I went and did a horticulture degree um, 
and a diploma, sorry, and um, worked in a garden and did landscape design. Um, did that for a little while. And even though I loved it, I wasn't feeling very fulfilled. Um, and then I um, started an apprenticeship uh, and worked at the establishment for a little while. Um, but worked under a real jerk of a guy, to be honest, who basically treated particularly female apprentices with a lot of disdain and certainly didn't treat me as an equal to the other apprentices. Um, so I got jack of that pretty quickly and left and got a job as a chef um, at the Palisade um, with um, Brian Sudek and Matthew Quinn at the time when it was a beautiful, old, gorgeous um, hotel where even though I guess I didn't have um, you know, the sort of high-end chef skills. I had cooked quite a lot in cafes and things by that stage and pubs. Um, and I sort of got to run pretty free. I was in charge of the entree and dessert section. Um, and I just sucked up. I just sucked it up, all the knowledge. Um, I learnt so much from those few years there before the Palisade closed down. So... That's sort of where it all began for me, I guess, from a professional perspective. You've been involved in um, many uh, cafes and also restaurants, which we can get to before moving to Young Henry's. Um, and some of them have been really interesting, different offerings like Susie Q Coffee and Records and The Kitchen Nook. T tell us about those and, and and what you were presenting to the market. Sure. So when the Palisade closed down, I um. I knew obviously that I, did, I needed a career in food um, and I was devastated because I had loved my job. Um, so I actually um, by that stage wanted to sort of start saving some money and I ended up, you know, as, as most of us do, moving home to my mum and dad's for a little while to try and save some money. Um, I think I was about 23 or 24 by that stage um, and I started at my own catering business um, and I started sort of catering for a lot of families in the sort of Northern Beaches area. But I think, yeah, I think coming from restaurants, um, I, I just craved that. You know what it's like, you know, being in, a, being in a commercial kitchen, working alongside other chefs, even though I loved catering, it's so laborious, so much work just for that, you know, that very short period of time. Um, and, I, and not working alongside any, any other chefs. So I started working in Avalon at a little cafe um, that was so horrendously managed that I didn't last very long there, but I did meet a lovely Canadian lady um, who was very much my senior. She was, I think, sort of twice my age. Um, and she didn't last much longer there either. And then I got a random phone call after I'd left saying, hey, what do you think about starting a cafe? And I was like, oh. I guess I've always wanted to do it, but I, I didn't think I was quite, quite ready. Um, she said, come on, let's go for it. We're going to work really well together. I was like, okay. So <laughs> we started looking around for a premises and found a disgusting old greasy spoon in fresh water um, where it had been um, like one of those places where it had like a bay marie in the front that had like one roast chicken and, and they were wondering why they never did very well. It was so disgusting. Um, and we took that over and completely gutted the place and turned it into, I guess, my dream of a cafe, which was always just really good, wholesome food where every single thing was homemade, um, lots of baked goods, working with lots of local producers and, um, yeah, created an amazing community around that between us. A lot of um, Canadian sort of influences from her, Boston baked beans, not that that's Canadian, but that came from her. Um, yeah, and just the community around it was absolutely incredible. And I ran that for four and a half years, I think. And then like many other people, the, the story ended when I had a huge run in with the landlord who was a complete jerk. Um, and I had to sort of walk away, um, gutted after so, after so long of building it up. Um, and my friend Jordan um, wanted to open a cafe in Surrey Hills, which coincided with us moving from the northern beaches into the inner west, which I'd always wanted to do. Um, and he asked me to go and, and get that established for him, which which I did. So then, yeah, Susie Q was absolutely amazing. It was a record store, which music is a big passion of mine as well, um, where we served wine 
another big passion and I get, got to create all this sort of gorgeous cafe food, which was sort of, I guess, a cross between cafe and restaurant in some ways. The, the, I guess for a cafe, the standard of food was incredibly high and, and still is. I, I left um, a couple of years later after helping him get that going and, the, and I think it's probably one of the standout cafe offerings in Sydney now. So. Well, I think I think Susie Q Coffee and Records was the first time I experienced your food, and and you're right, it was such a such a unique venue for even for Sydney, um, with such a high standard. And well, tell us about the food that you were cooking there, and, and um, what it what sort of, what it sort of how it exemplifies where you were at then. I think. Um Yeah, after going from my cafe, which was very much serving the needs of the local people in freshwater, which, I mean, I don't know if you know much about the people on the northern beaches, but it's all sort of very sort of health orientated. um, And and they have a real um, idea, I think, on the northern beaches, like what their expectations are of what a cafe should be and what the cafe food should be. So it's quite hard to do anything that's kind of a bit out of the ordinary. Um, I'm sure it's different now. And um, and then going to Suzy Q where I again had to sort of like free reign to reinvent what cafe food was, I, I went back to a lot of what I'd learnt working in restaurants and just kind of like fused it together. So, you know, you could go there and have beautiful slow-cooked lamb on, you know, a celeriac puree and, you know, salsa verde and stuff, like, but all just in, I guess the way, the way it was presented was a lot more restaurant than cafe. Um, and Jordan had spent a lot of time in South America uh, and he was obsessed with arepa. Um, so we used to do these gorgeous like open arepa. So, you know, taking the idea of an avocado on toast but then putting it on an arepa instead. Um, it was real fusion of, of cultures and, and restaurant and cafe. It was beautiful food. And every, t- every heading for the food was a song title. So we changed the menu quite regularly every couple of months and then we, we um, had to find songs that sort of correlated with the food in some way. It was <laughs> very creative. <laughs> and, again, we built an amazing community around it. It was, um, yeah, really special and a cafe that was really off the beaten track as well. It was underneath the old EMI building down a side street. Um, you know, you had to kind of know to go. So it took a bit of – it was a bit of a slow burn. But now it's just I don't think I ever go past there when it's not jammed, which is really fabulous. You mentioned that one of your great loves is wine and you nearly veered that direction in your career. Tell us about that period of time and and what direction it took you. Yeah, so during my time at Suzy Q, I, um, I mean, I'd always loved wine. I mean, I guess that's most people would say that but um i just i think through working there and and having it licensed and running wine dinners and stuff i um i just thought well maybe i think you know it's like when you're working in a cafe and you're doing short order and it's it's really stressful um and cafe is probably a lot more stressful than restaurant especially in that cafe just because you're working we were working in a very confined space and it was usually just me um pumping out the food maybe i'd be lucky enough to have a hand you know on a saturday or something um but the space wasn't really big enough for more than that and i i just got pretty over it i just got as much as i absolutely loved it i just thought god do i really want to do this like long term <laughs> no the answer is no. So I thought, well, I, my my next passion after food would have to be wine. So I um I took myself off and did a sommelier um, course, and I, and it was actually way harder <laughs> than what I thought it was ever going to be. Um, and then I thought maybe I'd actually combine combine my horticulture, my love of horticulture, and my knowledge of plants with the wine, and go off and do more of like a viticulture course um so get get into the growing of wine which to be honest is something that I still think about doing now um but then my life took a real twist and turn I guess when I found out about young Henry's a bar that had opened around the corner um from us and we walked there one night and um got quite drunk and I I thought why don't they have food like why why doesn't this tasting bar have food? So I went up to them at the bar and I said, "Why don't you have food? It seems weird that you have this nice bar but no no food offering and everyone has to leave." 
And they said, well, we're not quite sure yet. And I said, well, you should let me do it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was a couple of rums down by that stage <laughs> with, with them sitting at the bar. Um, I'm sure you remember those days, Huck. Um, and, um, and they said, okay, well, how's this for a deal? You come and bring your food and we don't have a kitchen, but you, you can bring stuff here to sell. We won't charge you to do that, but you just have to work the bar a couple of shifts. I was like, deal. So we started out doing that. But before it got any legs, we, um, we found out that for some reason, a tasting bar license doesn't actually allow you to sell food. Um, it's, a, it's a weird licensing situation. And I think if you have the tasting bar, you're literally only allowed to sell what you physically make on site and that didn't include food. Um, so we, we found out that we were actually weren't allowed to serve any of that. Um, but by that stage, I didn't want to leave them and they didn't want me to leave. So I became the bar manager, <laughs> even though that wasn't quite what I was going for. Um, and, and then before long, I sort of, that role evolved into, um, event manager and I ended up with the title Gen of All Trades because I basically just had to kind of do everything. I think when I started, I was employee number seven. Um, so it was Oscar and I running every single event under the sun. It was absolutely bonkers, but it was probably the most formative time of my life, I'd say. Well, the craft beer um, boom in Australia has been extraordinary to watch and Young Henry's has been a real driver of that. Is, are there any events or memories that you can tell us about um, over the years of, of organising these um, amazing events that you did for Young Henry's? I think, um, I mean, so many of them stand out or don't because we were drunk a lot of the time. But um, I definitely one of, the, one of the most amazing ones was Gourmet Escape. Um, where we got the tender, I guess, to do um, the event that they do down on, is it Eagle Eagle Bay down on the beach where it's one of the really beautiful events that they do right on the beach. Um, so I remember lugging kegs of beer down onto the sand and then serving all these famous people and famous chefs um, beer on the sand and then wandering around the markets. And I guess it was combining, you know, that, that, love and joy of food with serving good beer and being with good people and then sneaking into the after party and rubbing shoulders with all the famous chefs as well. That was absolutely incredible. Don't remember getting home, but yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, I, I think probably my favourite events though with Young Henry's were the ones that we did for, you know, the locals. We did so many little gallery openings and things. There was very little that we said no to as long as it was some form of community engagement, um, always supporting the local community. And I think that's probably one of the things that I'm most proud of for Young Henry's to this day is that that was always their thing was that, you know, they were always going to be giving back to the community. And as much as they've grown, they've never stopped doing that. They've always um, retained that connection with their local community, which is um, hats off to them because I think as as most companies grow, that's a really hard thing to hold on to. Um, they're stuck true to their their morales. So, yeah. You mentioned uh, the clientele on the northern beaches and how different they are perhaps to Surrey Hills, but you, you, you ventured back into that territory or Castle Craig to be specific and um, – and got back into the restaurant game. What, what drove that decision and and that uh, location in Sydney as well? Oh, that's a long-winded answer. Um, very convoluted. I um, while I was working at Susie Q, um, I I um, met a guy who, after many years of working for Young Henry's, contacted me and said that he had a dream of starting a hospitality business, um, like an umbrella, and that he'd like the first uh, venue to be a restaurant and he wanted to be involved. Wow. And Yeah. And I, I think, you know, obviously we'd had quite a lot of conversations about food and, and my desire to open a restaurant one day. Um, so it kind of came out of the blue again. Um, and... 
I, at the time, had just found out that I was pregnant with my first um, child. No, sorry, my second child. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I, I thought I, my in it, my gut instinct was sort of don't do it. It sort of seemed a little bit risky. But then I thought, well, oh, I've done so many things. Maybe it's time to kind of like take the plunge and just sort of go for it. And I guess never personally having the kind of money behind me to do something like that, knowing that if I wanted to open a, a beautiful restaurant, I was probably going to need the financial backing, which is what this would enable. Um, and we ended up partnering with a, with a big group, uh, a big financial group, property developers, who um, the, the reason for Castle Crag was that they owned the Quadrangle Shopping Centre. And, um, and they had a vacant site in there, which was sort of the right amount of square metres to do what we wanted to do, which was to open a restaurant that also served as a bar. Um, my business partners, and there are a few of them, um, most of their backgrounds were in um, clubs and, and bars. So, you know, we really wanted to promote that angle as well as the food restaurant angle. And it was kind of rolling in, you know, my wine and, and beer and sort of beverage knowledge with my food knowledge. Um, and we ended up with the chef who'd replaced me at Susie Q um, coming over um, and sort of signing up to be the, to be the head chef over there as well. Um, and I just got to have full creative control. It was absolutely amazing. You know, we all put money in, but then we had p people behind us, you know, putting in what the rest that was needed, which was a lot. Um, and it, I, I'd always wanted to have a restaurant. I'm very big on Australia and Australian produce. Um, and I wanted it to be very sort of Australiana and to feel like you were sort of stepping into someone's lounge room. I guess I wanted it to feel really comfortable. Um, but then serving only Australian produce, um, including, you know, beer, wine, spirits and um, and the food as well. So, and then drawing on influences um, from my travels. So, um, we ended up with a gorgeous rotisserie um, to cook chickens, which was sort of, um, I had the best chicken of my whole life traveling through Barcelona uh, and I wanted to try and recreate that at the restaurant. So, it was just really totally my baby as far as restaurants go it was my brain just putting everything in there that i that i loved T tell us about this chicken that you had in barcelona <laughs> being the best in your life oh i remember like walking down i was so i was i was 19 18 19 and walking down a cobbled laneway in barcelona and walking past this wall that had a, a glass it was like a glass wall and behind it was this incredible chicken rotisserie and watching these chickens go around and the juices just dropping off and being so poor because we were backpackers and my girlfriend and I had absolutely zero money and we were living off baked beans and bread basically. Um, and we just thought, well, bugger it. Let's just blow our whole week's worth of money on this chicken. And I remember getting this chicken and going back to our hostel room and sitting on the floor and just devouring it with juices running down our arms like caveman style it was like the, literally the best chicken I've ever had in my whole life it was absolutely amazing yeah <laughs> I want to go back <laughs> how was trying to translate that in a in a restaurant bar context um it, it do you know I think we actually did really well um Obviously, it's very difficult to, to take that memory and put it into reality, but we, we ended up with a rotisserie that was pretty much exactly the one that I'd seen in Barcelona, which I had a, a picture of. Um, and and um, Ryan, who's the most amazing chef, um, who's very passionate as I am, um, and really one of, the best, one of the best cooks I know, he, he managed after lots of testing to somehow get this chicken to taste very similar. Really, really good. Really, really good. Yeah. We trialed lots of different ways of it. You know, do you brine it? Don't you brine it? Do you marinate it? Do you not marinate it? What sort of, you know, spices and all those kind of things. And eventually we, we really came down to the, the decision that it's not really about the brining or the not brining or the whatever. It's the quality of the chicken at the beginning and then seasoning and then cooking it not too fast 
um, it just, yeah, it all just fell into place and now we've got this beautiful chicken. It's absolutely amazing, which I think is still one of the community favourites. I'm not there anymore, but I know it's going well. So, Well, tell us about your cooking. I know you love Australian produce and the local producers are very important to you, but where, where does a, an idea for a dish um, start and end for you? Depends on the dish, but um, I've got really good relationships with some producers um, in the inner west, you know, like vanilla teas and two providors, and um, we get all a, a lot of our fruit and veg um, from Sydney Direct Fresh Produce, um, all of whom I have like a really nice working relationship with. Um, and I, I guess that's probably from the, the too good perspective, but working from the restaurant perspective, um, it's always looking at what's seasonal, obviously, um, and coming up with the idea for a dish would stem from what's in season rather than, and, and I cook like this all the time, I guess I go to the, the supermarket or whatever, to the markets generally, and find the, the piece of produce. And then I create the dish around that rather than having the recipe and then trying to fill that recipe from you know with the ingredients if that makes sense I start with the with the produce first um and Ryan and I shared that philosophy at APRA um and he has amazing relationships with um the fish producer uh, sorry the fish um supplier he speaks to them every morning um we've got a wood-fired oven at APRA so we cook everything the fish in the wood-fired oven um so the freshness and the quality of the fish is like paramount as as is the vegetables so he speaks to the 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 um the growers and the producers to find out what's best and that and then he creates the dishes around that so yeah well, tell us about um too good co what sort of impact has this role had on you well it's been absolutely massive i um I never thought, I guess I never really factored into my life as a chef um, working alongside women um, like this. Um, and I know that Too Good are life-changing for them, but they are equally life-changing for us. Um, well, it makes me feel emotional just thinking about it, to be honest. <laughs> Um, we get we get these women usually about seven at a time um, come into the program and they spend generally around six months with us. Although I guess with COVID getting in the way last year and now this year, that's um, been extended quite a lot, and a lot of them have ended up with us for up to a year, which is good and bad. Um, and I, I just didn't know. I just I didn't know my capacity. Um, for um, taking on, I guess, the trauma of what these women have, have been through. And the, um, you know, that saying, you know, nothing's black or white and everything. You don't, I don't think anyone really knows the gravity of that until you've worked alongside these people who may have told to murder someone or may have, you know, done other horrible things in their lives. But once you know the depth of the trauma that they themselves have suffered, it gives you this amazing capacity to love and feel compassion. Um, and I don't think I, I had no idea about my, of, I didn't understand that about myself until I started working for Too Good. Um, I guess growing up on the Northern Beaches, even though I travelled quite a lot, you know, through India and stuff, I, um, I, I guess I've led a fairly sheltered life. Um, and then you come in living in inner west and you sort of, you know, experience the, the communities in Redfern and everything, and, but you're still on the periphery. And then when you're actually working alongside these women, you, um, you learn so much about them and then in turn learn so much about yourself as well. Um, it's been completely life-changing for me. Um, and I can't imagine, even though I have dreams of, you know, eventually opening another cafe or restaurant or whatever, I can't ever imagine actually taking that part of my life out anymore. So I think no matter what I do next, I will always have some element um, of something that gives back, you know, in employing these women into my next business. Not that I plan on leaving too good anytime soon. My role's just sort of growing and growing at the moment. 
Um, but eventually, yeah, I think it's had that kind of impact on me. I can't ever imagine just opening another business on my own without it having some kind of community engagement and impact. So, yeah. Well, uh, Jen, it's no wonder that you uh, once had the title of Jen of all trades. <laughs> Uh, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to share your story. You're absolutely incredible. Uh, please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Really nice to speak to you, Huck. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.